Three. The hunt begins. Chores could be, well, a chore. But Alex enjoyed looking after her small menagerie and didn't consider it a chore at all. She had grown up on the York Place, helping her grandparents run it. Even back then, it hadn't been what one would call a prosperous money-making operation. It had declined into a self-sufficient homestead rather than a business, years before her parents died and Alex moved here. The fields were wild meadows now, except the closest one. Her grandparents had used it to grow food enough for their own needs, and although Alex didn't have their expertise, she still grew vegetables there. She kept pigs in a fenced-off section of that field, mainly because it was close, but also because the spring ran through one corner of it, making it really easy to keep them watered. They loved messing about in the sloppy mud bordering the stream, and if it made them happy, it made her happy. The chickens, well, they just had the run of the place, but tended to stay near the barn opposite the house, probably because Alex fed them from the porch and couldn't throw their feed much farther than that. So her chores were pleasures, mostly. Living alone with only animals for company, she had found things to like about nearly everything. Not mucking out the horse stalls. She wasn't a complete lunatic yet. But everything else about living alone on a farm she had found ways to enjoy. This was her life. It was the only one she had or would ever have. And by the goddess, she was determined to enjoy it or die trying. Alex grinned at the whimsical thought. That morning she had fed the chickens and turned finding their eggs into a treasure hunt. She won. She groomed the horses and turned them out to run and play in their pasture. She sat on the top rail of the fence to watch them for over an hour, listening to their soothing thoughts and using them to wash away last night's nightmare. Although she owned both horses, she considered nuisance Jen's horse because Jen preferred him to Smokey's more even-tempered temperament. Alex would ride them both later. She doubted Jen would have time to ride until after she caught Sharon Bryden's murderer. Alex closed her eyes and reached out to the web. It was like stretching an underused muscle, and she groaned in pleasure. It felt good to let go. With no people near, she could do that without fear. The web reached back to claim her, almost joyous in its welcome. It was a gentle reunion. Not always so, and Alex relaxed a little more. The York Place was hers, her home, her place, and it knew her well. The web never hurt her here at the center of her own power. But it could, and was more likely to do so the longer she shut it out. It didn't like that. The web could try to overwhelm her to teach her a lesson, like the time at Blake's ranch. Sometimes the web hurt to touch anyway, regardless of how long she had withdrawn from it. She didn't know why, but it was almost as if people gave it a different awareness, a spiteful personality bent upon chastising her. It really could be true for all she knew. There was no one to teach her, after all. She had to make it up as she went along. People meant pain, one way or the other. Her chores complete, except for mucking out, Alex used the web and reached out to her fence line, the borders of the York Place, looking for wrongness. Was anything out of place? Anything to show the shadow man was aware of her? No, nothing. Everything was fine. No incursions of foul magic or strange shadows or weak places in the web? None, the web whispered back. The cycle of life and death. The balance, the natural order of things, was undisturbed. The goddess forbid, were there any cut threads like Sharon's poor tree? The web seemed to shy away from her awful thought, but then it edged close again. No, it whispered, nothing like that. Everything is as everything should be. The pigs were fed and happily making more pigs as nature said they should around this time of year, and the chickens were doing what chickens always do. The horses were full of the joy of summer. Katie lay curled up on the porch, watching everything, and the lazy cat felt all was well. Alex put a lot of faith in Katie's good sense. She opened her eyes and pushed the web away, sealing herself off again despite the web's protests. It was never good for her to forget who she was. 
The web was a temptress, making her want to stay connected all the time. Its power could invigorate, but it also consumed. Like a drug, it would addict. Forever trapped, she would never leave the York place. It was hard enough leaving now when she knew that she would have to deal with people. But at least she could still venture into town if she was careful and went prepared. She would fight to keep what little of her life she had remaining. No rest for the wicked, she said and jumped down from her perch and headed for the stalls and the mucking out she had been putting off all morning. An hour or so later, having finished in the stalls and after taking a shower, Alex was eating lunch in her kitchen and thinking about going for a ride when she heard a car pull up outside. She turned toward the window overlooking the yard already reaching out toward her visitor with the sight. She flinched and pulled back, hastily raising her barriers as high and hard as she could. Thomas had come for a visit. Joy, she said with a long-suffering sigh. She pushed herself to her feet, muttering under her breath and feeling her plan for a nice afternoon on horseback slipping from her grasp. If he was here, it meant someone was dead. Damn. She met him at the door. He stood there with his hat in hand, looking smoking hot in his uniform. God, as he looked good. He was still using the gym regularly. He must be. His biceps strained the short sleeves of his uniform shirt, and his chest looked as solid with muscle as ever. He had gained a little weight around the middle during the years she had been away, but it suited the rest of him. Without that tiny flaw, he would have looked over-muscled like a middle-aged man trying to recapture his youth and keep up with the kids. His dark glasses hid his eyes from her, but she knew they were full of hurt and stubborn, unfulfilled need. They always were when they looked at her. His eyes blamed her and accused her and tortured her with memories of the past. In their depths, she always saw regret but no forgiveness, and that angered her because she had done nothing that required his forgiveness. She was born this way. It wasn't her choice. If anything, he should be on his knees begging her forgiveness for shunning her back then. He would never get it, and maybe that's why he never asked for it. He knew deep down he had destroyed something good beyond repair. She didn't need to see his eyes. This close, his life thread hummed in her mind, despite her barriers being up at DEFCON 1. He could do that to her no matter how tight she shielded against him. If he touched her... Well, he better not, that was all. She didn't know how to keep him out if he touched her. One hand reached down to tug his gun belt higher to settle it on his hips, and that broke the spell. Hi, he said. Can I come in? Alex was holding the line against him like a soldier defending territory. She held the door open, one hand on the doorpost, the other holding the door half shut with her body in the gap barring entrance. She stepped back, silently inviting him inside. Thomas stepped inside and waited for direction. Alex closed the door and led him to the sitting room rather than her kitchen. He didn't need to see that she had dirty dishes in the sink. She gestured to the couch and claimed the armchair to keep some distance. The table between them provided some safety. What's up? She said, already knowing what it had to be. Sharon's killer had struck again. She would bet money on it. Sitting on the edge of the couch, he leaned forward, resting his forearms on his thighs and played with his hat, sliding it between his thumb and fingers of both hands between his knees. His hands slid together and apart, rotating the hat. Slide, turn, slide, turn. Alex forced herself to look up and found his eyes. He must have taken the glasses off when she led him in, because they were hooked into the top pocket of his shirt now. His eyes were naked. And yes, the familiar accusation and hurt was there, as it always was. I have some good news, some bad news, and some worse news, Thomas began. No games, she snapped. Thomas frowned. Ah, fine. Good news first, then. Your check is in the mail. You're officially my civilian consultant. The mayor signed off on it. 
You'll get your usual rate. How do you even know my usual rate? It's on your website, Thomas said. Oh, she said lamely. Of course it was, together with details of her more interesting cases. Well, those she was allowed to talk about anyway. Okay, I already knew the mayor had agreed. That time in your office, she told me. Told you. Right, he said with sarcasm heavy in his tone. Don't start. If all you came to do is tell me this, then you wasted the trip. You could have told me over the phone. If you came to badger me about my methods, you could leave right now. Thomas sighed. I came out here to collect you. That's where the bad news and worse news comes in. I have another scene I need you to look at. Alex nodded. I guessed it was something like that, and before you scowl at me, I'm not in your head, Tom. I guessed, just guessed. His face cleared of the impending storm. So, he killed again? Same M.O.? Thomas nodded. Pretty much. Some differences. A lot, actually. But it's him. The victim is a guy this time. That's one difference. He was killed indoors. But the eyes, heart, and runes are all the same. We kept that out of the media. It's not a copycat. It's him. Okay, I believe you. I told you that night he was practiced at this. I wouldn't be surprised if he has other bodies hidden out there somewhere. Older kills from before he got good at it. Thomas nodded, accepting that. So, you want me to take a look at the body? Yes, but... Thomas sighed. This is where the worst news comes in. The mayor ordered me to play nice with Radford. I had to let him do his thing. He raised a hand to placate her as her temper flared. I know you don't like it, Alex, but it's the best I could do. It was part of the deal. I play nice with him, and the mayor lets me use you. Alex nodded reluctantly. In your office, she was worried about my voodoo, she said, and Thomas winced at the acid dripping from her words. I guess I can understand, but my rules aren't just for fun, Tom. I'll be lucky to get anything worthwhile from a contaminated scene. Her eyes narrowed when he looked glumly at his hat. Okay, out with it. What more? Thomas sighed. We found the body yesterday. It's in the morgue now. Alex shot to her feet. You have got to be kidding me. No, absolutely not. I couldn't help it, Alex, he pleaded. You can still walk the scene, can't you? Even if our chances are slim, it's worth a try, isn't it? And I stalled the coroner. He'll wait on the autopsy until after you're done. That's got to be good enough. I couldn't put Radford off. He wouldn't stand for it again, and would have gone straight to the mayor and probably the Chronicle, too. I'm pretty sure he was our leak last time. Can't prove it, but I think it was. Get me close to him and I'll confirm it for you, Alex snarled. God is curse it all. You don't know what it's like for me, Tom. Morgues are... they're not good places. For me, I mean. Not good for me. I'll see things in there all the time. I can't turn it off there. Her voice dropped to a whisper. The last time I tried, I fainted. Thomas looked up sharply at that. In L.A.? Alex grimaced. She wouldn't tell him that she'd had nightmares every night for weeks afterward. Yes, but that isn't what Fremont was talking about. Different case. My last for LAPD. They didn't force me out. I left. But they didn't try to stop me. Tell me, Thomas said. Fremont said you weren't to blame. Alex scowled. Fremont has a big mouth. It was my fault. I don't care what anyone else says. I fucked up and people died. I was sure I knew who the next victim would be in a serial we were working. I'd been having dreams. Well... You know what I can do. I told the guys and they believed me because I was always right, she said bitterly. They put a watch on her, hoping to catch the guy, but it turned out I was completely wrong. I wasn't dreaming about the next victim. I was dreaming about the perp. Thomas winced. 
Female serial killers are rare. Not that rare. The cops got her in the end, but not until she killed twice more. But if they were watching her... Alex shook her head. They were watching her building to protect her, not apprehend her, she said bitterly. When nothing happened for a few weeks, they pulled out and worked the case the old-fashioned way. I was still dreaming about her, but the cops stopped listening. Then she killed two college kids, and a witness finally gave a good description. The cops recognized her right away from the protection detail they had tried. Those two kids died because of me. No one said it outright, but they were all thinking it. And before you make excuses for me, you know I mean it when I say I know they were thinking it, Tom. Thomas looked away from the pain on her face and nodded. It's in the past. What about the morgue thing? Alex grimaced. Might as well bring it all out there in the open. Ghosts are strange things. Not at all what people believe they are. Ghosts? Thomas spluttered. Don't tell me they're real, because I really would be happier not knowing that. You're not the only one. And they're not real if you think real means they're lost souls with something left undone. We aren't talking Ghostbusters and feeling all funky when you get slimed here. Thomas grinned. Love that movie. She knew he did. Bear in mind that I'm self-taught. I haven't found anyone to teach me about this stuff. The best I've figured is that magic or power or whatever you want to call it is everywhere and in everything. People, plants, animals, even rock. When something dies, magic is released. The problems start when that something is a person. Their magic sometimes hangs around, and it doesn't like being dead. Doesn't like it? Alex shrugged. I'm making this up as I go. I'm just explaining what it feels like to me. I could be completely wrong, but it feels like magic wants to be in things or people. It doesn't like not being. She winced at her poor attempt at describing it. I think it's attracted to people, especially to people like me who have a lot of it already. Magic wants to be in people if possible. I mean, if I'm right, it will be attracted to a live person before it will settle for anything else. Oh, Thomas said, and his eyes widened as comprehension dawned. Oh, crap. Exactly. A morgue is full of dead people with magic leaking out. Over the years, it saturates the place. So, morgues are what? Ghost batteries? Ghost magnets? Either, she shrugged. Both. Ghosts aren't souls. I don't think they are anyway. I think magic absorbs our memories and personalities through contact while we live, and then it all leaks out of us when we die. Sometimes it hangs about trying to find a new host. Or maybe it doesn't understand its body is dead and starts looking for it. I have no idea, but I do know that morgues are a trap. Once in there, the only way out is inside someone like me. Someone with magic enough to free it. So they're like a photocopy of us, but not us? I guess. Souls? I don't know about souls, but I like to think they're the original, and they just move on to what comes next. What happens to the ghost if the body isn't found right away? Alex shrugged. Like I said, sometimes it hangs around, but mostly it's absorbed by the web, living things nearby like plants and animals. Cities don't have as many sources of green things, and that's why I think magic is weaker there. I can always feel the difference when I go into town. Thomas nodded. If you can't go into the morgue, I'll understand. Alex frowned. I can go in, but it's harder to do anything once inside because I have to defend myself. The ghosts attack you? They want inside me, Alex said, and rolled her eyes at Tom's grin. Get your mind out of the gutter. I'm being serious. I am too, he said with a leer. She ignored him, always safer. In a morgue, I have to keep my defenses high to stop all that crap merging with me. I usually lower my defenses to work, and it's harder to do anything if I don't. 
I will see them everywhere. They're not usually a pretty sight. The time I fainted, I was overwhelmed. There were too many to fight. Do you know how many deaths L.A. sees per month? Thomas shrugged. A lot. There were 25 to 40 murders per month when I was there, depending on all kinds of factors. Even the weather affects it. Then add the deaths due to natural causes. Imagine how many bodies go in and out of those ghost traps we call morgues during the lifetime of the building. Thomas shuddered. Weeks of nightmares followed her fainting spell. She suspected the reason was that some of the ghosts had indeed managed to escape the morgue inside her, and that the dreams were real memories merging with her own. It made her feel ill thinking about it. Her magic was strong and had assimilated them until they were just a part of her, but she had to wonder what the result would have been if she hadn't been as strong as she was. Would she have been the one assimilated? Would her body be walking around with a different person at the wheel? She shivered, not liking the possibility. For all she knew, it wasn't possible, and the nightmares were just dreams based upon what she had seen in the morgue. But something deep inside whispered warnings that she would like to heed. She couldn't, though. Not if she wanted Shadow Man caught. Let's get this done, Alex said, pushing to her feet. The scene? Alex nodded. Scene first, and then the morgue. You're sure? Thomas said. Don't tempt me to chicken out, because I will, and then you're screwed and I'm down a couple of thousand bucks. Thomas grinned, but he could see the worry on her face. Alex tried to smooth her features and must have succeeded, because he nodded and headed for the door.